Okay, I think we can get started, right? Okay, great. Um, first of all, good morning, everyone. Um, on behalf of uh, GSV, oh, by the way, my name is Joy Chen. I'm with GSV. On behalf of GSV, thank you so, so much for being here at our conference. And also, I know this morning there are so many exciting sessions going on. Thanks for choosing us. And uh, I'm sure Esther will make this session engaging, interesting. Uh, and make sure you guys will have some takeaways uh, after, you, uh, after the session and um, make it uh, worth the time and also the money you paid for the ASU GSV tickets. Okay, so um, Esther, I have the privilege to work with her and also she's my good, good girlfriend. And we live very close to each other. Every other uh, week we would have a walk. So I had the opportunity to talk to her millions of times already. But never get tired of her talking to me. And today, I think this is a great opportunity. We have her here on the stage with me and share her wisdom, uh, her secret, and also um, her suggestions and advice about uh, education and uh, also parenting with us today. So um, without further ado, welcome, Esther. Thank you so much. And I'm so excited to be here with you, Joy. Joy is amazing. And also, I'm really excited to see all of you. Thank you so much for coming to this morning. It's really exciting to be the selected one, right? Because there's a lot of competition here in this hallway. And uh, I know many of you have known her or heard about her, but just want to brag a little bit about her. So she's the amazing mother. Uh, we call her the godmother of Silicon Valley. You probably have also heard about three of her daughters. Uh, Anne uh, is the CEO for YouTube, and the second daughter, Janet, is an amazing, um, successful uh, professor at UC at San Francisco. And the youngest daughter, Anne, she's the founder and the CEO for 23 me. And besides that, she herself has been an educator, teacher for over 30 years. 40. Oh, 40 years, I'm sorry. You look so young. Okay. <laughs> 40 years. And uh, some of her um, uh, students have become uh, very uh, influential journalists. And also Jeremy Ling and uh, uh, Frank, uh, James, James Franco. And also Steve Jobs' daughter, Lisa Brennan uh, Jobs, uh, was also her student before. And uh, besides that, she's also an award winner uh, for journalism, and also she is a wonderful writer. She wrote three books, right? Two. Oh, two, okay. And third the, one is coming. Oh, third one is coming. <laughs> Actually, we are planning to write uh, the third one, or the fourth, fourth one. But anyway, so her uh, last book, which is called How to Raise Successful People, has been the best-selling book ever since it was published. And also, we had the privilege, I mean, the Chinese readers, to have um, her copy uh, in Chinese. And that book has been translated into many different languages already. 27. Okay, 27. <laughs> and um, last but not least, she's also an entrepreneur. You can't imagine that. She has two startup companies. And uh, the first one is called Tract, which is an education app. Um, supporting kids, promoting kids, doing the peer-to-peer -peer learning. And the second one is a new initiative, which is called Watch.it. And she collaborates with uh, Berkeley and helping uh, putting together the online certification program to help the curious learners across the world. Um, so actually today, I'm going to start my question related to your book. Okay. So her book's name is How to Raise Successful People. But before I jump into this how question, I want to ask you a what question. What is success? How do you define success? That's a very good question. And um, so most people would probably define success as, you know, having a lot of money. And I don't do that. I, I think you have to have enough money to be able to eat and have a place to live and clothing and take vacations, just sort of the average salary. But what you need, in my opinion, to be successful is f feeling and having support to achieve your goals, whatever passion you have in life. And so if you have a passion and you have the support you need to work toward that passion, then I think you're successful. And I think here in this conference, I have met a lot of amazing people 
who are working passionately to make education better for all kids. And I would say those people are successful. They, they're not rich, they don't have you know, billions of dollars, but billions, I've seen a lot of billionaires, as you might not be surprised about, and I've um, seen a lot of unhappy people. So wealth does not equal happiness. So that's why I think, you know, I only wanted to be, when I was um, a young person, like 20s, I only wanted to be, en have enough money to just, you know, be a sort of middle class American. That was all, that was my goal. And uh, then I graduated and had a, have a teaching credential. And then I went to work, I remember, my first job in San Leandro, California. And I remember, I think I earned about $18,000 a year. And I thought that was, I cannot tell you, I was like over the top, so excited by that salary. You know, before that, I don't even want to tell you how little I lived on. <laughs> so that's my definition. Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> no, no, I think this is short. We expect like a longer answer for that. Um, but no matter what, you have raised like successful daughters. And uh, I was reading a book like many, many years ago, actually, which impacted me a lot, which is called, maybe many of you have read, uh, Seven Habits of uh, Highly Effective People. And one of the seven is uh, begin with the end in your mind. So when you first became a mother, have you ever thought about, because you just mentioned the goals, have you ever thought about what kind of goals you want your daughters to achieve and what kind of like people you want them to be and how successful you expect them to, to be? So when I first had my daughters, so I didn't, want, I didn't want to be the kind of parent that my parents were. My father was born in the Ukraine. My mother was born in Siberia. So they had a very sort of Russian attitude toward bringing up children. I don't know if you know what that means, but that's really strict and they believe in hitting kids. Um, the idea was spoil the child if you spared the rod, basically. Also, they put it... Similar to the Chinese kind of parenting methodology. Yeah, it was pretty tough. And so um, what I did instead was I decided I wanted to be a very different kind of parent. I wanted my children, my number one goal for my children was to be independent. That was it. I wanted them to learn as much as they could as early as they could. And so that's all I did, is I, I focused on that goal because there was no book out that was telling me how to do it. I couldn't find anything. The only book that I ever had was Dr. Spock, and he was concerned with how, you know, your child's diaper rash and things like that. And so I didn't want to do that. but. Um, so and I wanted them to grow up to have, you know, the kind of life that I thought I was having, you know, an academic life. My husband's professor of physics at Stanford, and I was a teacher at Palo Alto High School. And so I thought that was, that was it. I never had any other goals for them. But of course, you'll find out they had other goals for themselves. <laughs> yeah, I think that's great to let them find out their own goals um, when they right. grow up. And now I'm going to move to that million dollar question, how to raise successful people. Okay. And uh, you have written that amazing book. Um, I want to um, see if you can share with the audience, maybe with like uh, four or five minutes about what are the secrets, your wisdom of raising successful people. Yeah, I'd be happy to share the book with you. Also, what I wanted to do, I think I mentioned before, I thought it would be great to take questions from the audience about like what are things that you are interested in? Because, you know, I I've also sat through a lot of talks and sometimes my questions aren't ever answered. So I thought, that's, let's- That's great because she's a great teacher. I'm sorry, I forgot to uh, tell you guys about this. So what we have planned is we have 40 minutes on stage uh, in this room. Well, now we have 30. And now we only have 30. <laughs> <laughs> So we two probably will talk for the next 20 minutes, and we will open the floor to you guys for your questions uh, for the last 10 minutes. So if you have any questions you want to ask her, um, 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 
feel free to stand up and uh, just shout out your question and uh, make sure you get answer from Esther. Yeah, so can. I think, you know, unlike most times, you know, they wait to the end. You can raise your hand and I'll stop in the middle. Okay? Oh, we already have one. Good. <laughs> Screen time. Yes, I, I think all parents today struggle with the same thing. It's, it's a problem. So I'll incorporate that answer into what I was going to talk about my book. So when I was writing this book, How to Raise Successful People, you know, I, I came up with an acronym. And the, the purpose of the acronym is to help people remember what's important in the book. And, you know, as a teacher, I know that, you know, you say something to the kids once, and they sort of nod, and then you say it twice, and they're like, oh, I think I might have heard that before. And then you say it a third time, and they finally get it. So I wanted to, to make sure people remembered what I was writing about, and so I put together this acronym TRIC. And TRIC stands for Trust, Respect, Independence, Collaboration, and Kindness. So trust your kids, respect their ideas, give them some independence, collaborate with them instead of dictating, and treat them with kindness. Because they always make mistakes, tons of mistakes. And so you never want to hold a grudge, ever, because then they never want to try anything else new. So now talking about your question about kids and screen time. So one thing you should be doing with kids, and I've tried this out on my grandchildren too, so I should tell you it works, at least with them is that you explain to them why it's bad to have too much screen time. So you have a discussion with them. This is part of collaboration. You talk about it. And then you give them the responsibility for coming up with a solution. They have to come up with a solution. And then you talk about it. And so I can tell you in the book there's an example of we took all these grandchildren, I have 10, took them on a vacation in Napa. And it was a very fancy hotel. And we get there, and they're all on their phones. It's like, hey, why do we have to pay all this money for you to be on your phone? It's ridiculous. We're, we're on a vacation. So some people wanted to just confiscate the phones. You know, that's, I think that's normal. Just like, take it away. I said, why don't you give them the opportunity to come up with the plan themselves? So all the kids got together, and this is like lots of different ages. It was like a powwow for about an hour. I don't know what they were doing. You could hear them fighting with each other. They came up with a plan, and then they presented it to us. And the plan was no phones from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. We almost fainted, because <laughs> we never would have done that. And they kept to it. They did it because they came up with the plan. And then I also did very similar things in my classes because my classes were big, 70 kids in a class. Actually, it was really interesting. One of my former students was just here and came up to introduce himself. Yes, yes, um, he graduated 2018. And in my class, every year, I would say to them, well, what's our goal? What's the main thing we're doing? And then, how are we going to deal with people that violate our plan, you know, use their computer or use their phone when we're having discussions or whatever? So they had a responsibility, they had one class period to come up with the rules. They came up with the rules, we posted the rules, and I'm telling you, never had to enforce them, never, because they did it themselves. So that's what I advise you to do with your child. And it works with these grandchildren of mine, too. So, um, you know, each parent, well, there's three of my daughters, and so they all have their own families and their own rules, but the rules are very similar. And they've all been collaboratively um, discussed, and they've come up with those rules. So it's crazy. You know, we don't think kids, you know, they're so little, they're like, oh, my God, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they're doing. So I think... 
you need to realize that they do. They know a lot more than you think. And so that might be a possibility for you. So tell me whether you think that would work for you. <laughs> With his phone? Yes. Oh. So you should show him the data on why it's bad to sleep with your phone. I mean, just be more convincing if you argued the first time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> okay, in the back here, there was a question. Of course. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Kindness, collaboration, independence, trust, the respect, right? Yes. Sounds great in theory. But today, a lot of parents, especially, well, not especially, in my experience, in America, feel a great sense of desperation because the kind of life that you're describing, a, a middle-class life where you can provide and have a vacation, is getting harder and harder to come by. And so parents feel this sense of desperation and they want to do everything they can to put their kids on a path where that life is attainable. It, right. it, it's a real sense of fear. And so all of a sudden, this value that you have of independence goes out of the window because, hey, you want to sign them up to the Russian School of Math, to a, an evening coding class, et cetera, et cetera, because it's harder to get into college. And going to a good college really matters uh, more and more. So how, how do you grapple with the challenges of the modern day in the context of your philo parental philosophy? So I, I think what you're talking about is you want kids to do things that you think are going to put them on the path to success. And that could be a variety of classes that they take and the way that they spend their free time. And um, so I th I, even though you might think that it's better to force kids to take those classes that you want them to take. You have to ask why the depression rates in the US are so high. I think there's just much more in the way of competition to get in colleges, as you mentioned. And so parents are more um, emphatic about what they want their kids to do and take. And so I think the byproduct of that is a lot of depression. And the depression rates in college, I was just at this um, women's lunch and I met this woman who has a, a whole website dealing with this depression. And the rates are over 50% of college students are depressed, but clinically depressed. Um, you know, in my era of growing up without any technology at all, um, there wasn't that tr pressure. The pressure comes from, we all know what everybody else is doing because we all, it's the tech, you know, on social media. And so you read it and you're like, oh my God, the guy next door or down the, doesn't even have to be next door. Kids are doing all these things and my kids are not doing it. And so therefore, you know, they're probably not going to get into the college of their choice. So all this pressure results in a sense of anxiety and depression. So I think, you know, you, you might want to ask, though, you know, my three daughters were very successful, or they are very successful. So I never helped any of them do SAT tests, nothing. But I tell you, I did do crazy things. So I bought a box of vocabulary cards back in the days when vocabulary was tested. And I went around with the scotch tape and I taped vocabulary cards all over the mirrors. <laughs> and I changed them every week. And so, you know, it was kind of... <laughs> it's kind you of give, did you give them the test about like, no, how much they know? No, I did not test them on anything. I just said, well, here's some vocabulary. You should probably learn it this week. Here it is, it's on the bathroom mirror. And then I, um, I also did something where they wanted to kill me. Um, I made a vocabulary tape for them with me talking and giving the definitions. And, I re and <laughs> they used to play it in the car. 
but be, I replaced their music tape with my vocab tape, and they were furious. Is so. the tape still <laughs> there? So yes, I still have the tape. <laughs> Maybe so I mean, I did do a few things like that, but I, you know, there were just a few. I didn't, I didn't pressure them to apply to the colleges they wanted to apply to. I, I just, I figured, my theory was, if it was meant to be, they are in charge of their lives, and they have to control it. And, um, and none of them were depressed, let's put it that way. Um, I don't know, does that answer your question a little bit? I think there's consequences for forcing your kids to do things that you think are gonna get them into college. And then of course, we saw those terrible things that happened um, when the parents were involved of you know, stealing or uh, you know, trying to get their kids into college by negotiating with this guy to change the answers on the S. You know, people are going crazy about this. Also, there's a book, you know, Malcolm Gladwell wrote this book, David and Goliath, Did you? it's a great book. Chapter three of that book talks about the big fish, little fish theory. So a little fish in a big pond does not do as well as a big fish in a little pond. And so if you have a kid that's gonna end up being the lowest person in the class at Harvard, he's gonna do much worse and feel badly about himself than he would have if he went to another school. So you have to think about that, you know? Um, and if just look at the CEOs around the country, how many of them went to Ivy League schools? Very few. So, uh, you know, why fight to get your kid into those schools? I just, I have to ask myself, why would you do that? Anyway, I never did that. and. Um, they all ended up going to these very expensive schools, which I said, okay, if that's what you want to do, that's, that's great. Um, any other question? I saw another question in the back there. Yes. Hi. One of the things that kind of I hear from the TRIC framework, which I love that acronym, is sort of this idea that underpins it that we're sort of chronically underestimating what children can do. Um, like, yes. And I wonder if that resonates with you and if you could talk a little bit maybe about a story that could illustrate that. Um, but that just seems so like important, particularly like for this conference, education. That's, it's, we are chronically underestimating what kids can do. I mean, one of the, th I wrote a blog post during the pandemic saying that if you're having tech problems at home, you've got a tech expert right there in the family and you are not paying any attention to them because that kid knows a lot more about tech than you can ever, than you'll ever know. The other thing, in the US, did you ever notice that in the US people don't speak any other language besides English? You know, unless you're born in some other country. So why is that? We start teaching language at the age of 13. At the age of 13, your opportunity to learn language, that's, it's over. We should be teaching when they're small, when they're little. They're very talented at learning multiple languages. So why don't parents do it? They're worried that they won't get proficient in their mother tongue. So it's, it's really ridiculous. That is one thing. The other thing, kids, kids are kind of like clay. If you mold them early the right way, they're going to grow into all those opportunities. And I talk about that in the book about, it's kind of crazy, I'm sorry to tell you about sleep. When kids sleep. So the French have a really good way of doing the sleep, and I talk about it in the book, it's called a sleep pause. So when your baby is born, the only thing it knows how to do is two things, suck, and sleep, that's it. So we don't interfering, interfere with the suck process, <laughs> we just let them do it. But sleep, parents somehow seem to think the kids don't know how to sleep. So they're rocking them and they're shaking them and they're doing all kinds of things. Honestly, that child is born knowing how to sleep. 
And so if you interfere with that, then you're going to end up having to do that for long periods of time. And if that child ends up sleeping in your bed because you're afraid of who knows what, it's never going to want to get out of your bed. Have you, have you checked online about all those parents who have like seven and eight-year-olds who won't get out of their bed? Uh, I'm not joking. This is not a joke. It's true. So um, you let your child sleep. And you know if they start fussing, you do what the French do, which is like a pause. You let them fuss a little bit, and then you go in and you pat them on the back a little, and that's it. I'm telling you it works. The whole, I'll tell you, all of France seems to do it. And so, and their kids sleep through the night right away. So um, anyway, that's just an example, I think, of what kids can learn early. My children learn to swim at the age of 12 months. You'd think kids can't swim? Well, I had a swimming pool. I wanted to make sure they didn't drown. And uh, so they learned to swim. OK, they weren't doing the perfect Australian crawl, but they could get from one part of the pool to the other. They also learned to ride a bike when they were about three. Why three? Because they decided they wanted to ride the bike. And I was like, OK, whatever. No training wheels. Just kids can do a lot early, a lot earlier than you think. You can let them help around the house. Susan was 18 months old when she folded diapers. OK, that people's like, oh, child labor, right? No, she was very proud of folding diapers. That was a skill. She thought it was great. So that's part of what I talk about in the book, is really give your child an opportunity to do things that are real. And then don't worry about it. You know, they're, they're fine. Question, yes? So one thing I've always said to my kids, the number one thing that people regret on their deathbed is not listening to their inner self and doing what everybody else told them to do. So you can go online and find that out. It's research that's been done. And I think that kids need to know early that you do what you think is important and not what your friends tell you or think is important. And so in this family, this is what we do. And you know, you can't control the whole world, so don't follow your friends just because they're your friends. You personally have to think yourself. So I would do it and I would I would try to be convincing. You know, that's what I did with all my teenagers. You know, classes, of, I mean, this is not even 70. Well, maybe there are 70 people. I had classes this big. All teenagers, you know, most people are like, oh, don't, set, don't get me next to all of them. You know, teenagers are they're very independent. And they also, most of them like to speak their mind. So I'm just telling you, talking to them does wonders. And I think we don't talk to teenagers enough. We tend to tell them what to do or lock them in their room or, you know, ignore them or other things. I think none of those other methods work. So that's my suggestion. Yes, in the back. There's a question over there. Oh, actually, OK, and over here. There, there. All right. Sorry. Thank you. Really. My name is Mary. I can speak up if needed. Um, appreciate your insights and wisdom. Would be curious, as you see your own children go from young people to adults, or from high school to college to adulthood. How, what are your insights on how parent, the role of parents changes as they do gain that independence, literally and figuratively? I think the biggest challenge for parents are really, is really the teenage years. Because kids become, I mean, the, I think it's an innate biological drive to be independent and to think independently. 
And of course, they get into trouble in school, they get into trouble with you, they get into trouble all the time. Um, I think it's important for you to always keep the communication channels open, number one. Uh, of course, you know, my kids were no different. I mean, they did a few things. I wrote about it in the book, <laughs> about uh, the challenges they presented. And as young people, as 20-year-olds, they all traveled. And it was very hard for me to allow that to happen. And Susan went to India by herself, the age of 21, not knowing anyone. And Janet, not to be outdone by Susan, um, went to South Africa. Johannesburg ranked as the number one most dangerous city outside a war zone. Um, it, was, it was just tough. But what you have to do as a parent is to say, you know, I've taught them everything I can. And now it's like a, they have to fly on their own. And then Anne, again, not to be outdone by our two sisters, she went by herself on the Trans-Siberian Express, the whole train, into China, Tibet, um, Nepal, she, all over the world, really. And, you know, I mean, I was like months, I didn't even know where she was. So, you know, it was not easy. But, um, you know, they're very proud of themselves and they became serious independent thinkers as a result. So, I just think, you know, unfortunately, it's a difficult time. There's a so. question over there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the trade-off of how much time to invest in active parenting, especially in households where you have two working parents in the pandemic where many of us have had to do our jobs and teach our kids. How do you think about like how much time you should be putting in, where to be investing that time when time is such a scarce resource for parents right now? Well, I think there should be designated time. Um, it doesn't have to be long, but it does have to be designated time so that the kids can count on it. I think that's the most important thing. You know, the difference, kids that are the firstborn versus kids that are the thirdborn, do you ever notice that thirdborn are more independent? <laughs> and it's, it's because the parent have no time. So just do that for all your kids. You know, they have a certain time when you're together with them, and the rest of the time they have to be on their own. You know, I never met, micromanaged their time. They always had coloring they could do, they always had their toys they could play with, but I didn't micromanage. And today there's so much micromanaging and it's based on a lot of the theories that you said. You know, you want to make sure your kid is doing everything he can do to get into the college of his choice or whatever. And um, just too much pressure on them. Let them do it themselves. Honestly, they'll be fine. And um, like I said, well, you have to believe in them, trust them. You know, they have your genes, by the way. <laughs> and one thing I want to add here is, if you add too much pressure to your kids, you will have a lot of pressure on yourself. And I truly believe when we are at our best, our kids see it, we influence them, and then they will be at their best. Right. Anyway, so next question, please. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, Esther. Hi, Joy. Hi. So I wanted to ask a related question is, do you see this trick framework being applied for families who are maybe lower income, have a lot more toxic stressors in the environment, just have a lot more challenges just getting by day to day? Yeah, I, I actually see this as being useful in, in low income families. So I grew up in poverty. My father was an artist. And you remember how much artists earn. <laughs> and he was not a popular artist, and my mother didn't work. And they, they, neither one of them had a college education. They didn't even graduate from high school. Father, he dropped out in the eighth grade, and my mother never graduated. So, I mean, I was responsible for a lot of, lot of stuff. And, um, and that didn't hurt me. If anything, it gave me, I was very competent. I was able to do a lot of things that other kids couldn't do. I learned to cook because I had to help. 
And um, I actually had my kids participating in, in the family a lot. My husband worked so much that he didn't have a lot of time, professor of physics at Stanford. You know, they're often, they're, they're overworked because they have to produce, they publish or perish kind of thing, so it was really tough. And so I used them as my resource and helpful. They were part of the team. And actually in the pandemic, it was, I found it really interesting, my daughters did the same thing without ever being told. All the kids were part of their teams. So they couldn't have any housekeepers, nobody taking care of anything. So the older kids took care of the younger kids, they did the laundry, they did the vacuuming, they did everything. And the kid that was in charge of the vacuuming, she was six. She went around all over the house doing that. So, I mean, I do think that it works for all, all um, economic groups. And uh, it's your attitude, it's, your, it's the way you think about it. And by the way, the, we thought about it at the, this whole pandemic, which has been terrible. Um, we thought about it as an opportunity to teach our kids more skills around the house. And we didn't say that they were in any way deficient. You know, that, that one, um, that's all over the country. That there's, I even have a paper that talks about, you know, how the kids are, you know, having all these problems. But in fact, it's your mindset. And the mindset was, okay, you didn't learn all the stuff in school, but you learned a lot of other things. And so, anyway, we tried to do that. I mean, I know a lot of people did learn, um, did suffer from in many different ways. We only have like three minutes, so we have time for one last question. Who has the mic? Oh. I think most people in here will agree that um, reading books is like fundamentally critical for a, a child's brain development, especially yes. the zero to five range. What in this age of digital media? How do you um, how do you see? incentivizing or encouraging children to read books independently of, of school and just having a passion, deep passion to read? Well, I think kids, for all of you, kids model after their parents. If you read, your kids are going to read. And I'm telling you, a lot of parents model looking at their phones. So you have to be careful. And um, so I always read a newspaper in the morning and my kids all read newspapers in the morning. And I never said, read the newspaper in the morning. They just like did it. So I think that's the most powerful thing. The other thing I did is I was a community activist. So I was always going around the community, you know, doing one thing or another, agitating for parks or libraries. And my kids, I didn't even realize I was doing anything that influenced them. And they all decided to do the same thing. It's like my mom did it. Well, uh, you know, so be careful. You know, that's, I think, the main thing that you can do is to model it, read books to them, and then also remind them, you know, when they're on their phone, they can actually read a book on their phone. You know, there's a lot of books. You know, Audible is also on the phone. If they don't like to read, they can listen to it, or if they've got ADD or something, you can listen to books on your phone. So um, that's the main thing. But I think reading is so important. That's, that's where you learn a lot. Do one we more minute, maybe for one <laughs> last question. Yeah, this gentleman on the uh, first row. Yeah, yeah, speak loud. Um, so, I, you only have one minute, but I would love to hear your, um, what do you see your role, especially in your grandkids, and also your children, your role in an academic job. So outside of school, how do you see that you actually add to their education? I, I appreciate everything you're saying about kind of life, but specifically around it. So I'm very focused on education. I, I see it in the way that many people here at the conference see it. It's like a force for being able to have a good life. You know, the more you know, the better off you are in being able to solve problems. And so with my grandkids, I really never had to say anything about it because my daughters, they, they do, you parent the way you were parented, by the way. Very important. Also, you teach the way you were taught. So in order to break that cycle here in the US and the world, you know, where it's lecture dominated, we have to 
have to do something more than just talk about it. We really have to change it. So my, for example, all my grandkids have books read to them. I never said read a book to them. They did it on their own. And then kid, they're young, and so they see everybody reading books, so they want to read too. They want to go to the bookstore. They want to go to the library. Um, again, they follow the leader. So I think the big problem in families where there's a lot of poverty and people don't read books, kids grow up without that model. And so that's why it'd be best if we could somehow help them understand the power of reading to their kids when they're little and the power of reading yourself and then you know, designating an hour in the evening or something like that where you can all read you know, from eight to nine before you go to bed. Actually, it helps you fall asleep, by the way, in case you haven't tried it. You know, all you have to do is read something really boring, you'll fall asleep right away. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Actually, uh, as you all know, we have already come to the end of this session. This is the easiest panels, uh, panel I have ever had. Thank you all <laughs> for helping. <laughs> uh, and also, uh, Esther will do her book signing uh, somewhere, right? Yeah, I'm doing talk? book signing at the, the bookstore, which is just on the other side of the staircase over there on the second floor, right upstairs. And so if, if you have like questions, to. you can also carry it over there. Uh, while she's doing the book signing, you probably can't get her time to answer yeah. quickly uh, for your questions. So thank you so much for coming and for listening to all these answers of mine. And I'd be delighted to answer more questions when we're just Enjoy talking to Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks.